This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where we take a closer look and dig a little deeper into this week's sermon. What's going on, Bible nerds? We are in Acts 7, and we're talking about Stephen, so let's take a closer look. Let's do it. Clayton, who is Stephen? Stephen is the first martyr. Or, uh, that's how I was taught to explain who Stephen was. Yeah. He was... He's the first recorded martyr. Yeah, he was a deacon, though. Yeah, in he's the early a deacon church. in the early church. So he's a servant. Yeah. And the last part of chapter 6, the arrest, um, beginning in verse 10, this is about, St- or let's just start in 8. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. And then it talks about some of his opponents, skipping down to verse 10. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated some men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and scribes and got him seized and set before trial for the council. First of all, all of that set up thing with the religious folk that should feel very jesus-esque to you yeah right they plotted against jesus they're plotting against stephen it should feel very jesus-esque to you the other thing that should be like just i think glaring at you in the story is clayton how do we affectionately refer to luke's gospel it's the gospel for the outcast it's the gospel for the outcast the gospel for the oppressed yeah the gospel for the other mm-hmm. of society. Um, and that's the one where Jesus says, for this, for I did not come to serve, but to, uh, I didn't to come be to served, serve, but yeah. to serve. Yeah. Um, and give a ransom, give my life as a ransom for many. Um, the fact that Stephen is the first recorded martyr and he's also a named deacon. Mm -hmm. Think about this, okay? This is storytelling development. These things do not have to be necessarily happening in a very strict chronological order, and there can be pieces left out. This is storytelling, and it's okay. You shouldn't miss that Stephen is one of the named deacons. You're told that they're to serve. He does that deed of serving, and these things start to happen. So it's like a, you know, the first will be last and the last will be first kind of situation. Mm. And it's that dude, once again, just like Jesus, yeah, that gets arrested and killed for doing good deeds, yeah. for doing good work, doing good things. And so then chapter 7 begins, and he's before the um the high priest at his trial and they're really asking him why are you talking about jesus and why are you um i mean what do they what do they say we have heard him speak blasphemous words against moses and god he's reinterpreting the story and it says in verse 6 14 or 13, they set up false witnesses who said, this man never stopped saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed on to us. What's the lie? What's the false testimony? Um, that Jesus will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses and blah, 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 blah. I actually don't, I actually don't think that's the lie at all. I think that's exactly what Jesus did. Did Jesus not? say that he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? He did. And did Jesus not say many, many times, you've heard it said by but, Moses, but I, say but I say to you. So what's the lie? What the lie is, is that this man never stopped saying things that are against this holy place mm-hmm. and the law. Stephen's story is very much in connection with Moses and the story of Israel. And that's why his defense is a movement 
through that story, beginning with Abraham, back in Mesopotamia. Now, this is interesting because in Genesis 12, when you're introduced to Abram, you're told he's living with his family in Haran. Yeah. So you, you're going back to, or at least Luke is trying to go back to pre Moses being introduced into the, I mean, um, uh, Abram being introduced into the story. Mm -hmm. So he goes and he says, and then he left his country and he tells this great, beautiful story. And then he gets told about Abraham and Isaac and that he'll be this great nation. Yeah. And then it goes to Joseph, which Joseph is a great story. And I've got a lot of text here to cover, so I'm not going to go through all of it. Joseph is a great story. Because Joseph ends Genesis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joseph is the last character in Genesis. But Joseph is not a patriarch. No. Joseph is one of the 12 sons of the patriarchy. Yeah. So Joseph is not a patriarch. And Joseph is not a great transitional character. And I think Exodus opens by telling you that he's not meant to be one. Because like the second or third verse of Exodus, and then there was a Pharaoh in Egypt who did not know Joseph. Mm -hmm. So Joseph is not a transition character out of the book of Genesis and into the book of Exodus. That means that Joseph is the intentional concluding character to the singular story, the book of Genesis. I think there are a lot of ways that you can see Joseph as the perfect ending to the book of Je Genesis. But in order for him to be the perfect ending, you have to, he has to be solving the problem that's introduced in the beginning. Mm. Right. Um, however you do that, you can do that, but he must conclude Genesis like that. He's not a transitional character. Let's stop with that narrative. He is doing something for the book of Genesis. Mm. He's the only person in the darn story that doesn't pursue power, and yet it's given to him. Yeah. There's something to that. And I also think it's very easy to go from Abraham to Egypt. Yeah. You don't need Joseph. Yeah. But Stephen chose to put Joseph in. He left yeah. out Isaac and Jacob. Two other patriarchs. He didn't include everybody in the story, mm. but he chose to add Joseph. Joseph's the only person in the story that didn't pursue power and was given to him. Hmm. Just like a servant who didn't pursue power, but is given to him. Just like a king who didn't have a throne that he was exalted on, but he's exalted on a cross, enduring pain meant for others. Do not miss the storytelling that's happening here. So then Stephen moves to Egypt and slavery. One of the defining moments of Israel's history, if, if not arguably the defining moment with the Exodus. Moses, a man of nothing. Yeah. Literally, by the time he comes, he's nothing. And he has so little confidence in himself, he has to ask for Aaron because he's like, I can't speak. He's like, I'm not, I'm not good. I'm not good. I'm not good with my words. Nobody's yeah. going to listen to me. So you get this great Moses story, a man who brings about restoration from nothing. Like, literally, he is nothing. He's, a, he's just a dude living off his father-in-law in a foreign land, and he's a murderer. Yeah. And he tells the Moses his murder story. Mm -hmm. and then he tells his call, the, you know, the burning bush. And then he skips, you know, obviously they do the crossing of the Red Sea. And the actual Exodus, because then they do the golden calf. Um, and the golden calf seems to be this kind of... It's the climax of Stephen's speech. Mm -hmm. Because everything's led to this. This has been a move. This has been a story of the movement of God throughout Israel's history. And what he's done is say, this is a very real story, and there are really things happening here, and we are going to be faithful to that story. Um, but here's the people who didn't. 
And you did it by having an image. You did it by having this thing, this box that you had to put God in. And he, and he concludes that. He transitions out of that literally to God in a box, mm -hmm. the tabernacle, and then the temple. Once again, do not miss that Jesus reinterpreted the temple. That is a big deal. Judaism is defined by the temple. We call it, literally, do you know what we call the Judaism of Paul's day? Mm. Second temple Judaism. Yeah. Because Judaism is defined by the temple. It is the place that houses God. Yeah. Why else would you not be concerned with that? Yeah. The temple is a very important mm. motif. And so he builds all to it. And he says, and, and he puts in here two very unique stories that you don't need to tell the story of Israel. But he intentionally includes the story of Joseph, a man who doesn't pursue power and is a servant or is abused as a servant or a slave, and then is given power multiple times over. And the story of the golden calf, the place where a people who had just been restored and were in the process of being given commands by God mm -hmm. chose to make an image, to put God in a box. And then, oh, I'm going to tell you, you also put him in a box, tabernacle, temple. And then this is what Stephen chooses to say. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you're forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. And now you've become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. Shots fired, my man. Yeah. If that's not the most radical reinterpretation I've ever heard, and especially in the way that he tells the story of Israel, yeah. the, the stories he chooses to highlight and draw out of, and the way in which he develops that telling, and they clearly know. Mm -hmm. They know exactly what he did. Yeah. Because it pisses them off. Yeah. It makes them so angry. This phrase right here, this is why I have my Greek Bible up. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth. Um, it's very strange wording. Ground their teeth. Yeah. Um, and it's very specific. Yeah, it's... It really is a weird word. It's not used in the Greek. Uh, it's not used in the New Testament very often. That word for like to grind or grit. Um, it's a very strange word. And the word for how, how angry they are. Um, the best gloss I think is like they became enraged. Yeah. Like they, they, they are overcome with anger. Um, and then that grit your teeth. Um, that it's like a very personal. It, when they heard these things, they became in, they became enraged in their hearts in the heart. Yeah. In their hearts. And they grit their teeth. Yeah. They ground their teeth. Yeah. Um, they gnash their teeth. No, it's not gnashing. Um, no, that's, I mean, or at least that's what this says. No, no, no. Uh, and, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a personal, um, To bite, to gnash. But it's a personal cause. It's like a choice. Gnashing yeah. of teeth. Began gnashing the teeth at him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, you're, the, the problem I have is you're making it passive. Um, I'm not doing it. No, anything. no, no. I know. That translation is making it passive. It's not. 
it's active. You are making the choice yeah. to grit your teeth in response to the confusion or the frustration you have in that moment. They became enraged in their hearts. That, that's what the Greek text says. Th this is a very personal, intimate moment that's happening with these people. They get what Stephen has done. Yeah. They are very angry because it's a version of the story. Right. And... And so the text continues, but filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. Son of man language, uh, man, it's already 15 minutes in this podcast. I do not have time to go into it. Son of man language um, comes from Daniel chapter seven. Go look that up if um, you want to know more about that. But the looking up to heaven mm. and this language here and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing. Clayton, what happens at Jesus's crucifixion? Do you remember? The veil was torn in the temple. Oh, so something was ripped open. Yeah. Um, and Jesus looks, looks up. up to heaven. Yeah. It says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Um, all of this yeah. moment should feel very crucifictorious. Yeah. Um, because that's what it's supposed to be. It should be a mirroring of Jesus mm. and that, that crucifixion moment. Because, and I'll go ahead and tell you, spoiler alert, when Saul in chapter 9 meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, do you remember what Jesus says to him? No, I don't. Why I don't. do you persecute me? Oh, yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Why is it important that Stephen's story mirror Jesus's? Because Jesus goes to Saul and says, why do you persecute me? Hmm. Those people, that's me, my man. Yeah. You've done to them what you did to me. Yeah. Hmm. So, this should feel very Jesus-esque to you. Then he says, then the text says, but they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. So, why is it important that they covered their ears, Clayton? So that they wouldn't hear what the message that needed to be heard. And why why is that important to the storytelling? What 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 does that tell you they think is happening? It's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. You cannot hear blasphemy. So what is blasphemy? That's what they accuse Jesus of. That's yeah. what they accuse Stephen of. I mean speaking ill against God or speaking a false story or yeah. Who gets to be the determiner of what's faithful interpretation? These guys. Unfortunately, no. it's the institution. Mm -hmm. This is why Wellhouse is not set up in a way that the institution holds power. Yeah. The institution holds infrastructure. Yeah. The institution institution facilitates formation. Yeah. The institution is not the guardian of doctrine. The institution is not the top of the power system. Mm -hmm. The institution, and I myself as a spokesperson of the institution, are just facilitators. We're yeah. just infrastructure. Because if we're powerful... We get it wrong and we do stupid stuff like this. We get it wrong and we do stupid stuff like John MacArthur. We get it wrong and we do stupid stuff like Mark Driscoll. Yeah. We get it wrong and do stupid stuff like lots of white evangelical pastors and people of power that are way too connected to politics and re Republican candidates. That's just the nature that we live in in the Texas Bible Belt. Mm -hmm. I don't want anything near that. And here's why. Because in chapter 9, Saul is going to have a moment with Jesus. A moment that no one 
can explain, and yet a moment that no one will ever be able to convince Paul did not happen. Mm -hmm. This is the person that that was pre-Jesus. Verse 58. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Once again, I said it in my story. Those two sentences should be screaming at you. Jesus' crucifixion scene. This is a mirror storytelling of that moment. When he had said this, he died. Chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of their killing him. That day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. Once again, shout out practicing presence in our series on lament. It's okay to be mad. Verse 3. But Saul was ravaging the church, by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women, he committed them to prison. This man, who thought he was doing the Lord's work as a Pharisee, as a religious zealot, thought he was doing the Lord's work so violently and aggressively. He's he's a religious extremist. Yeah. Dragging people out of the safety of their homes just to throw them into religious jail. Mm -hmm. That dude had a meeting with Jesus and had to spend. There's an I got an entire book up there called the the, between Damascus and Antioch. uh, Paul between by Martin Hagel and over 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 over. Yep, right there. What's the subtitle of that book right there, Clayton? Uh, the Unknown Years. You could, go, you could call those the deconstructing years. The years where Paul was silent because he had to figure out, how do I reinterpret this story that I've given my life to in light of the person of Jesus? Yeah. And you know what the rest of the book of Acts is? Mm. Is us hearing the stories of how he pissed off a lot of religious folk. Yeah. Because he reinterpreted the story, but also how he liberated thousands and thousands of people from oppression because of the message of Jesus.